Amen. Your fruit shall abide. Amen. You will not say, I won't converse, but they never, they never come in to the church. They will come. A new day, a new era, a new dispensation, those uh, converts will come, they will abide in Jesus' name. And then it says that whatsoever, whatsoever you ask in my name, you ask the Father in my name, uh, that he may give it you. Those are the verses we are looking at today. And you will see that uh, the word fruit comes over and over and over again. As we look at God's universal creation, fruitfulness is his unchanging demand, unchanging desire. The whole creation was made to be fruitful. And in the natural, he wants us fruitful. In the spiritual, he wants us fruitful. And as you look at it from the very beginning of the Bible, you'll see that this is the demand of God and this is the desire of the Lord. Tonight, I'm talking to you on God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. But look at it from the beginning of your Bible. We're reading from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. So you see the demand of God and you see the desire of God. He wants you fruitful. He wants me fruitful. He wants every one of us fruitful. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Fill up the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You see from the opening chapter of the Bible, from Genesis chapter 1, he wants you fruitful. He desires that you be fruitful and he, de he demands that you be fruitful. Chapter 9 verse 7. In chapter 9 verse 7 it says and you is now particular because this is now after the flood and you be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. There can be no doubt in anybody's heart who knows the Bible, who reads the Bible, that God demands fruitfulness. God desires fruitfulness. We're looking at Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 6. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 6, look at what it says here. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. All the time, all the time, from the opening chapter of Genesis, it says, fruitfulness is the demand, and fruitfulness is his desire. I will make thee fruitful, exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come of thee. We're coming to chapter 35 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 35, and we're looking at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, And God said unto him, unto Jacob now, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. There's no doubt in your heart now that when he calls anyone, he wants that one fruitful. As he calls you into the kingdom, he wants you fruitful. God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation. And a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And then we're going to the Bible now, Old Testament. We're looking at Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, we're looking at a verse 3. Psalm 1, verse 3. Here now he's talking about, it's not talking about the family now. He's talking about your moral life. It's talking about your righteous life. It's talking about the fact that you know the Lord and you're separated from the world and is expecting some kind of fruit in your life. Look at Psalm 1 verse 3. And it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His fruit, his fruit. Thank you. 
the fruit of be a fruitful vine by the such thy table behold that thou shalt the man be blessed that fearest the Lord and so you see the the, the reason why we're talking about a fruitfulness fruitfulness and more fruitfulness and much fruitfulness in proverbs it tells us in the chapter 11 proverbs chapter 11 and i'm reading from verse 13 proverbs chapter 11 we're looking at verse 30 it says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life he said we started with a family he started with natural fruit bearing fruit naturally but now he's talking about spiritual fruit and he's talking about the righteous one and he says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls everybody tell me it's wise that she is, you are now a child of God. You have been won to the kingdom of God yourself. And now you become wise and it is that wisdom, the wisdom of the spirit and the wisdom of the scriptures and the wisdom that you gain as you study the word of God from week after week, that that wisdom now leads you to win souls into the kingdom. Now the converted believer, the believer is a converted person. The believer is a conditioned person, and the believer is a commissioned person, and is converted, is conditioned, and is to is commissioned to bear fruit. Whatever he does, whatever he becomes in life, fruitfulness in the kingdom is God's measure of a purposeful life, if God's measure of a profitable life and God's measure of a pleasing life. When somebody says, I'm, I praise the Lord, I'm born again. I thank the Lord, I'm converted. And then the word of God is reconditioning you and is making you face the right direction. That in life now, you know that you're living for something, a purposeful believer, a practical believer and a profitable believer pleasing the Lord, there's something you are going to find in your life. And it is fruitfulness. We're coming to the New Testament now. And we're starting from the opening the book of uh, Matthew, which is uh, the first uh, book of the New Testament. And you will see, just like in the Old Testament, it demands fruit. And God desires fruit the same way he desires fruit today and he demands fruit today we're looking at Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 in Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 but when he saw many of these Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism he said unto them O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come look at verse 8 bring forth therefore Therefore, if you are coming out of, uh, you know, the, the darkness of the world and the sins of the world, and you're coming to the Lord so that your sins will be forgiven, your life will be transformed, it says, therefore, bring forth fruits, plural, fruits, meat for repentance. Look at verse 10. There in verse 10, and now also the access laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that bringeth forth not a good fruit is hewn down, cut down, and cast into the fire. You see the desire of God, He wants fruitfulness. You will bear fruit. Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Every tree that bringeth not good, for, not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. We're looking at Mark chapter 4, verse 20. In Mark chapter 4, verse 20, he's still telling us the desire of God and the demand of God. He wants fruitfulness. You will bear fruit. And look at this in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word. You see that? You hear the word. Your life has not been transformed. You hear the word and you are washed and you are cleansed. You hear the word and then you become fruitful. Look at this in verse 20. It says they hear the word and receive it and bring forth, tell me, Fruit, some, tell me, 30-fold, some, 60-fold, and some, 
a hundredfold. If you see the grading there, number one, thirtyfold bearing fruit. Number two, sixtyfold is bearing more fruit. And then number three, a hundredfold is bearing much fruit. And we look at um, Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, again, once again, uh, it's still reminding us that the essential thing of the Christian life is bearing fruit. You cannot just say, I'm born again, I'm converted, I'm a child of God, I'm a member of the body of Christ. And then we we'll say, where is your fruit? I'll say, am I supposed to bear fruit? Yes, you're supposed to bear fruit. In fact, the, the more you go on in the Lord, you bear more fruit, and then you bear much fruit. We're looking at Mark chapter 13, and I'm reading from verse 6. It speak also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon. That's what he's seeking for in your life. That's what he's looking for in every life. But he found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none cut it down, while cumbereth it the ground. And his answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dunk it, and if it bear fruit, well. You see that? That's what he's looking for. If it bears fruit, that will be good. If not, then, uh, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And then we come to Romans chapter 6. The fruit were to bear. What he calls fruit. When he says we should be bringing forth fruit. And when it says, you will be bringing forth fruit, you'll bring forth fruit. Look at Romans chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Now, being made free from sin, born again people, children of God, and they're living the victorious life and the righteous life, it says now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have, tell me, your fruit unto what? Unto holiness and the end everlasting life. It shows you very clearly the demand of God as well as the desire of the Lord. He wants fruitfulness. Without fruits, our lives, our existence is not well pleasing to God. Now, when he's talking about fruit, what kind of fruit is he talking about? Number one is a fruit of repentance. Somebody has turned away from sin, and then he comes to know the Lord, is believed of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's a change of life, a change of heart, a change of direction. Number one, there's a fruit of repentance. Number two, there's a fruit of regeneration regeneration that is there is a change in the heart there's a change in the life there's a change in the character that regeneration will bring fruit number three is the fruit of restoration somebody has been a backslider and is being like the prodigal son far away from the lord but he said i'll go back to my father i will say my father i have sinned against you and against heaven i'm no more worthy to be called thy son Make me one of the servants. And then he came home, and the father received him. He is restored into the family of God. And when there is that reconciliation and restoration, there must be fruit. The fruit of restoration, the fruit of reconciliation. Number four, it is the fruit of righteousness that somebody says now, I am redeemed. And the Lord has turned my life around. If that life has been turned around, there's righteousness. And what we see there, we're going to see the fruit of holiness, the fruit of righteousness in that person's life. And then number five, the fruit of revelation. You know, if somebody, before you came to the Lord, you were in darkness. You didn't know anything. And now you came to know the Lord. And the scripture has been expounded to you. You are being taught every time. I see that. I see that. I didn't know that before. 
Now I know that. Now I know about conversion. And now I, I know about salvation. Now I know about sanctification. Now I know about the kingdom of God. That revelation that comes to you must be a fruit. The more you know in the Lord, the more you have in the Lord, the more you are going to bear fruit. The fruit of revelation. Number six, the fruit of reunion. You see, when you are united with Christ, he is the husband and you are the bride. He is the bridegroom and you are the bride, that reunion as you are united with the Lord, there is fruit bearing and it is the fruit of reunion. There's the fruit of renewal. Number seven, you see your life is renewed and as your life is renewed, there's revival in your life and you are, so, you are so excited, you are serving the Lord now, that renewal, that revival will bring fruit in your life and now the more you look into Christ and you look at his face, the more you look like him. It says we shall see him and we shall be like him. There's a fruit of resemblance. You resemble the Lord. You're looking like the Lord. You are talking like the Lord. You learn from the Lord. You lean upon the Lord and because of that resemblance to Christ, that is a bearing fruit in your life. And then number nine, there's a fruit of reproduction. The fruit of reproduction. And Christ Jesus said, he that believeth in me, the works I do, he shall do. And greater works than he shall do because I go to the Father. When you're doing the works of Christ, you're living like Christ, you're evangelizing like Christ, you're healing like Christ, you're doing things like Christ would have done. If Christ were your situation today, then you're bearing the fruit of reproduction by Christ, the fruit of re reproduction through Christ, and the fruit of reproduction in Christ for Christ. And so we understand what the Lord is looking for. He demands fruit. You will bear fruit. He desires fruit, you'll be a fruit. And when the fruit is your life, everybody will see that there's a change that has taken place in your life. As I said tonight, we're considering God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. God's demand and desire for the believer's fruitfulness. Three things we're looking at as we study the passage today from John chapter 15. Number one, the price of treasured fruitfulness for Christ. The price, the price we're paying. The things we have to do. The denial we have to go through. And the faith we have to go through. And everything we have to do, the price we have to pay. The price of treasured fruitfulness for Christ. Number two, the proof of true fellowship with Christ. I'm a friend of Christ. There's a proof for that. I'm in fellowship with Christ. There's a proof for that. I'm, co I'm connected with the Lord. I'm abiding in the Lord. There's a proof for that. You must show that this is real. And it is not just talk of mouth. Point number two, then the proof of true fellowship with Christ. Number three, the privilege of the trustworthy friends of Christ. The trustworthy friends of Christ. The privilege such people have. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one over there. Wonderful church. The prize of treasured fruitfulness for Christ. We're coming to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm going to read from verse 7 all through to verse 10. So you'll see what the Lord is saying. He says, if he abides in me, and uh, my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. It says, Herein is my Father glorified, that she bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. It says, you cannot just say, I'm a disciple of Christ, and then you're fruitless. I'm a disciple of Christ, and you are empty. I'm a disciple of Christ, and there is no profit of you in the kingdom, and you're not contributing anything to the kingdom of God, as you say that you are a child of God. It says, herein is my Father glorified, that you in particular bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples, that the Father has loved me, even so have I also loved you. It says, continue ye in my life love. And it says, if uh, ye keep my commandments, ye abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. And let's back up to verse 4. 
In verse 4, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. It's saying the price we pay. The things we do, if we're going to bear fruit, is that we continue in Christ. We abide in Christ. We're embedded in Christ. And we are totally in Christ. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. He wants us to bear fruit. You'll bear fruit in Jesus' name. Let, let's come to that verse 10 again. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. What's the price the Lord is telling us we have to pay if we're going to bear fruit? That's the price of abiding in Christ. Temptation will come and try to get you out of Christ. Say, no, 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 no. I'm going to remain in Christ. Somebody there said, I'm going to remain in Christ. Trials, challenges, and pressure, suppression, whatever may come. And then people might even threaten you if you remain a Christian. And you know, the secret of bearing fruit is that you abide, is that you remain. And you're going to remain in Jesus' name. Uh, look, look at First John and look at the importance of abiding, abiding in Christ. We're looking at First John chapter two, verse uh, First John chapter two, and here we're looking at uh, verse six. First John chapter two, verse six. It says, "He that says he abideth in Him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked." It says, "If we're abiding in Christ, here is what's going to happen: you live like Christ." You talk like Christ. You behave like Christ. You see, in any situation and in, at any crossroad, in your office, in the home, anywhere, what would Christ do? What will Christ do? The man who is abiding in Christ, the woman who is abiding in Christ, will do what Christ would have done if Christ were in that same situation. Look at that verse 6 again. He that says, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk. Even as he walked, look at verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. It says that if we love the Lord, if we abide in the Lord, that we're going to show that love by acting in the light and living in the light and there'll be no occasion of stumbling in your own life look at verse 14 in verse 14 i have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning i've written unto you young men because ye are strong praise god you are strong somebody there i am strong and the word of God abides in you. You see that? That's how to bear fruit. The word of God abides in you. It's not that the word of God is coming in through one ear and then going out through the other ear. It's not that we're hearing the word of God like on Monday and then at the, in the evening after the Bible study, we can't even remember what we have heard. And then on Tuesday, we can't apply what we have heard, but we hear the word, we take in the word, we believe the word, we digest the word, and we live by the word, and then in our offices, anywhere we go, they will know that the word of God has come into us and abiding in us, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Any overcomer in the house? Ye have overcome the wicked one. And it is by the word of God abiding in us that we actually overcome. And then it goes on to say in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the loss thereof but he that doeth the will of God tell me 
abideth forever. Those who come out of the world, they come out of the pollutions of the world and they abide in the word of God and the word of God is abiding in them and they live according to the word of God. It says those are the people that are going to abide forever. The, the, the price will pay so that we can bear fruit. Let me show you this important verse in Isaiah chapter 37. Isaiah chapter 37, and I'm reading from verse, uh, reading from verse 31. Isaiah chapter 30, chapter 37, and uh, verse, uh, tell me the verse, 31. Let's look at this. It says, uh, uh, have you opened your Bible? I see some people still opening. I'm not going to wait for you because I have a lot of verses to read today. Look at it. Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 31. It says, And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downwards and bear fruit upward. You see that? There's a connection there. It's like a tree. And the more the root will sink into the ground, the more the branches will shoot up and then there'll be fruit on the branches. It's telling us that you as a child of God, as you go deeper in, the, in your root, in the foundation, and you go into Christ, and deeper into the scripture, and deeper into the love of God, and deeper into the ocean of his uh, promises, some, and the, everything he has provided for you the deeper you go downward then the higher you go upwards look at that verse again it says in the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and then bear fruit upward you will bear fruit in Jesus name it tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 17, and we're reading here from verse 7, blessed is the man. Looks like this one is talking about me. I said he's talking about me. It says, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. The person is trusting the Lord who is believing the Lord, and he says, whatever temptation comes, I will overcome. Whatever challenges come, I will overcome. Whatever enemies do, I will overcome. They will not stop my journey halfway. They will not discourage me. I will not backslide. I'm going to trust in the Lord. He saved me, he's going to sustain me. Is sustaining me, is going to sanctify me. He has sanctified me, is going to baptize me and fill me with the Holy Ghost. He's always trusting in the Lord. And that face in the Lord, look at what it generates in verse 8. It shall be like a tree planted by the waters. And that spreadeth out her roots by the river. And then it says, it shall not see heat when the heat cometh but her leaf shall be green. Amen. I'm going to make it personal. My, my leaf shall be green. Amen. And shall not, it says, and shall not be careful, shall not be anxious in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You'll keep on yielding fruit. Amen. Fruit of righteousness, you'll keep on yielding. Of regeneration, you yield in Jesus' name. Of total restoration, reconciliation, you yield in Jesus' name. Fruit of revival. Days of revival are coming in our church, and you'll be yielding fruits of revival, renewal, in Jesus' name. And you'll be yielding the fruit of revelation. Look at all the revelations the Lord is giving us. And it's revealing the truth in depth unto us every time. And it says, there's the fruit of uh, this revelation. It will be seen in every life in Jesus' name. We're coming to, we're coming to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 24. 
John chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 24. The fruit we bear has a price. There's a price to pay. And you want to pay the price to make sure that you're bearing fruit and your, and your fruit yielding uh, ability will not cease in Jesus' name. We're looking at John chapter 12, verse 24. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. You know, if you so cherish your life, you preserve your life, you protect your life, you can't go out, you can't touch other people, you can't go into your community, you can't evangelize, you can't do anything. It says, if you love your life like that, You'll be alone. It says, except that corn of wheat will fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, that is plant it. That is, give it to the soil. That is, throw it. Throw your life to be of benefit to other people. That's what it means by saying, if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You'll bring forth much fruit. Yeah. He that loveth his life, verse 25, shall lose it. But, and he that hateth his life in this war shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, I will serve the Lord. I said I will serve the Lord. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. We're coming to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse 2. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. And this passage is talking about uh, the fact that we are married to Christ. If you're a child of God, we're connected with Christ. We're married unto Christ. And we're wedded Christ. And because he is not barren, there's nothing wrong with him. If there's any fruitlessness, if there's any barrenness, the fault will be on our side. Because Jesus Christ is complete. Look at it now. Romans chapter 7 verse 2. For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from that law, from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. And if, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no more an adulteress, though she be married to another man. See the spiritual implication, application, wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Him who is raised from the dead. Who is that? Jesus Christ. We're married to him now. You're converted. You're married to Christ. You're born again. You're married to Christ. You're reconciled by the blood of the Lamb, by the death, substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. You're married to Christ. Look at the result that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You see that? That's the purpose of that union with Christ. Look at verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Verse 6, it says, but now. Somebody shout, but now. But now. That's the dividing line. That's the conversion right there. That's the regeneration right there. That's the change, the transformation that has come. Because it says, here is the way we were. We were outside in darkness. We were fruitless. And we didn't have the nature of God inside us. And then we repented. And then we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there is a reunion with the Lord. And it says, but now we're delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Amen. Yeah. 
That means the change has really taken place and then we're bearing fruit. What kind of fruit are we bearing? We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. The fruit that we bear now. Now that we're children of God, now that we're born again, and now that we know the Lord, and the grace of God has come into our lives, look at the fruit we bear. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ, they who belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and the laws. That's the price we pay. Christ paid the full price to save us. Christ has paid the full price to sanctify us. Christ has paid the full price to baptize us in the Holy Ghost and to empower us and to equip us and to prepare us for fruitfulness. And now, it's your turn now. It's my turn now. It's our turn now that we must also pay the necessary price in preparing ourselves for fruitfulness. What kind of price do we pay? Number one, we must be willing and desirous. It's not just that you know somebody is not interested in bearing fruit. It cannot bear fruit. There must be that willingness and desire. Number two, we must abide and consecrate. We abide in the Lord and we consecrate our lives and we say, Lord, I want to bear fruit. And I want the fruit to be evident in my life. Number three, we also want to receive and retain the heavenly vision. The heavenly vision. Paul the apostle said, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. And when you are born again, as a real child of God, you are hearing about evangelism, evangelism. You receive that. You accept that. And you understand, you are receiving and retaining the heavenly vision. Not only that, you are purged to be prepared to be a fruit. And you are dead to the world and alive unto God. You are dead to the world and alive to God. Anything coming from the world that will sap your spiritual energy. Anything coming from the world that will destroy your usefulness and fruitfulness. You are dead to them. Not only that you have and you keep the might of Christ. Let this might be you which was also in Christ. And as you keep that mind of Christ and you are thinking what Christ will think. And you are looking at what Christ will look at. And you are going where Christ will go. And you are doing what Christ Christ will do, thank God, you are going to be a fruit. And then you'll be crucified and fully identified with Christ. Crucified and fully identified with Christ. You'll be able to testify like Paul the Apostle. You'll say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And this is not something that is imposed on you. You present yourself to Christ. You identify fully and completely with Christ. I'm willing to pay the price. Whatever it will take, I'm willing to do so that I will be fruitful. You'll be fruitful. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray to be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number two now. The proof of true fellowship with Christ. The proof of true fellowship with Christ. And what the Lord is telling us is that if we say we're in fellowship with Christ, there's a proof for that. It's not just an empty testimony. Somebody says, I'm in Christ. Anybody can say that. Where is the proof? That's what the Lord is looking for. Point number two then, the proof of true fellowship with Christ. We're coming to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and we're reading from verse 11. John chapter 15, from verse 11. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This things I have spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you. There's the joy of salvation. There is a joy of fruit bearing. You see, the 70 returned with joy. And he said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And they rejoice because they were bearing fruit. Number one, because of salvation. 
they rejoice. Number two, because of service, they rejoice. And he said, as they continue in that experience of salvation, and then they're growing in that experience of salvation, it says their joy will be getting higher and higher, and eventually your joy will be full. This is my commandment, that she love one another as I have loved you. And then it says, greater love has no man than this, that a man should uh, lay down his life for his friends. Look at this in verse 14. Yeah, my friends. Yeah, my friends. If, tell me. Say that again. Yeah, my friends, if you, do, if you do whatsoever, I command you. It says there is a proof. If you really love the Lord, there is a proof. And if you don't love the Lord, well, you know, people around you can tell because of the kind of life you live. Let me show you Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13, we're looking at a verse, we're looking at it from verse 1. It says the proof of our love for God and the proof of our fellowship with God is that we're obedient to the word of the Lord. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams uh, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and that sign, the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go at our other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet. Nobody will make you backslide. Yeah. Or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God, tell me the word, proves you. The Lord your God is proving you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. When the temptation comes like that, when somebody is trying to draw you away like that, when somebody is trying to make you live contrary to the word of God you are hearing, the Lord wants to know whether you will abide in the word or not. He's proving you. And it says in verse 4, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. Obey his voice. And you shall serve him and cleave unto him. You will serve the Lord and you will cleave unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. And look at chapter 4, chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 2. Mark this, your Bible is a very important verse. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I, which I command you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall ye diminish or subtract aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. That ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. Because, you know, if ye keep my commandments, then are ye my friend. If you keep the commandments of God, then are you the friend of Christ? It says you will not subtract, you will not add to that word. Look at that same chapter, and we're looking at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. And that's the evidence that we really know the Lord and we love the Lord and we are connected with the Lord and we are being saved and regenerated, transformed by the Lord. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 6. In verse 6 it says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord your God with uh, all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. When it says, the Lord shall circumcise thine heart. That's another word for sanctification. Circumcision not of the flesh, but of the heart. It circumcises your heart. And that's sanctification. And when that sanctification has taken place, look at what will follow. It says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you will live, you will live in Jesus' name. 
Look at verse 8, verse 8. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord your God and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. So that's the proof that you are circumcised. Somebody says, I'm circumcised. I'm sanctified. And then after that sanctification, we cannot see a better life. We cannot see a richer life. We cannot see a life that is going deep into the obedience of the word of God. Look at verse 10, verse 10. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep the commandments of of the Lord and his statutes, which are reaching in this book of the Lord. And if thou shalt, if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that's the evidence of that spiritual, um, spiritual circumcision and sanctification. Look at uh, verse 16 here. In verse 16, it says, In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. Very clearly then he expects that if we say we are saved, if we say we are children of God, if we say we have any connection with the Lord, redemptive connection, transformational connection, it says we must be obedient to the word of the Lord. If you keep my commandments Commandments, then are you my friends? Let's come to Psalm 119, Psalm 119. I'm reading here from verse 60. Psalm 119, verse 60. Keeping the commandments of God, that's the evidence, and that is the proof we know the Lord. That is the proof we love the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 16. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. I'm so excited. And I desire to please the Lord. And he says, I made his, I delayed not to keep the commandments of the Lord. Look at 115. That is uh, verse 115. In verse 115, it says, Depart from me, ye evil doers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. He is my God. He is my father. He is my savior. He is my redeemer. And I've made up my mind. There's no other commandment to keep. It's the commandment of the Lord. And all those who are backsliding or they are sinners and they want to influence you. You say, depart from me. Because I've made up my mind. I'm going to keep the commandment of the Lord. In fact, actually, Ecclesiastes tells us, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm looking at verse 13. It says, uh, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. This is the evidence that you, are, you really know the Lord. And this is what God is going to look at on the final day. It is not that, you know, I go to church. It's not like I have a Christian name. It's not like I was baptized. And what all those things are good. But the final scene, the evidence and the proof that we belong to the Lord. Look at what God is going to look at. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion the conclusion of the whole matter. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and do what? Keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. This is why we're here. This is why we're studying the Bible. This is why we're born again. This is why the grace of God has come into our lives. This is why the Lord is teaching us in the scriptures by spirit so that we'll keep the word of God. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret sin, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I pray you'll keep the commandments of God. We're coming to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, the proof of true fellowship with Christ. The proof of true fellowship with Christ. John chapter 14, reading from verse 15, it says... In chapter 14, verse 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If ye love me, keep my commandments. The proof of loving Christ is living for him. The proof of loving Christ is living as he has commanded. The proof of loving Christ is living 
as he lived, living like he would live today if he were here and if he were confronted with a situation or a circumstances. Can anyone say, I love God, I love Christ without listening to him? Somebody says, oh, I love the Lord, I love the Lord with all my heart. I love him so much. The number one thing, if you really love him, you will listen to him. Can anybody say, I love God, I love Christ without learning of him? It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And then it says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Can you say you love the Lord? Number one, without listening to him. Number two, without learning of him. Number three, without living only for him. You're not living for yourself. You're not living for the world. You're not living for society. Only living for him. Number four, can you say you love the Lord without laboring for him? You see his work is there to be done and the people are not saved and the field is not harvested and uh, you know termites are coming in and all the wild animals are coming in and the false prophets are coming in and taking the people away into darkness into false doctrine and you are there and you say I love the Lord can you say you love the Lord without laboring for him number five can you say you love the Lord without leaving the world behind you and saying uh, the things that were gain to me everything I drop everything I leave behind can you say you love the Lord without leaving the world behind you and losing everything for his glory and for his sake can you say you love the Lord without leading souls to him leading souls to him the lost are there. The sinners are there. The people are there. And they're waiting for somebody to guide them. And somebody to lead them into the kingdom. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Well, show it by the kind of life you live. Can you say you love the Lord without loving only what he loves? And without loving only who he loves supremely? If you say you love the Savior, prove it by the life you live. If you say you love the Savior, prove it by the things you do. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by the labor of love that you render. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by the desires in your heart, the thoughts of your heart, the plan of your life. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by whose commandment you keep. Whose commandment you keep. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by the total commitment you have unto him. If you say you love the Lord, prove it by submission to him in all things. Prove it. Prove it. You must prove it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 8. Prove. Prove. Very important. You must prove it by what you do. Don't give empty testimony. And don't give a testimony that God is not packing up. You are going to prove your love for God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. And to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. The proof is very important. You say you love the Lord, there must be a proof, there must be an evidence. Second Corinthians chapter 8, the proof. Second Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 22. It says in Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22, And we have sent with him or them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent. We have often proved diligent. You see that? There's a proof. If we say we love the Lord, we know the Lord. If we say we're connected to the Lord, we're converted by the Lord, prove it. It says we have oftentimes proved him a diligent in many things. And now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 5. Chapter 13, verse 5 of 2 Corinthians. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Prove your own selves. Prove your testimony and prove your confession and prove your dedication. You say, I love the Lord, prove it. I'm a friend of Christ, prove it. 
I'm born again, prove it by the life you live. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, you will not be a reprobate. Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 4. And let every man prove his own work. I'm a minister, prove it. I'm a soul winner, prove it. I love the Lord, prove it. I'm profitable in the kingdom, prove it. I am fruitful, prove it. I am faithful, prove it. And let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. First Timothy chapter 3. In First Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. First Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 10. And let these also first be proved. Let these also first be proved. It's not enough for somebody to just say, I'm born again. Let these also first be proved. It's not enough for somebody to say, I've learned the word of God. I'm living by the word of God. I'm a friend of Jesus. I'm in fellowship with Christ. Let these also be first proved. Then uh, let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. We're coming to, back to John Gospel according to St. John. And we're looking at uh, this chapter 15. Chapter 15. We come to point number three now. The privilege of the trustworthy friends of Christ. The privilege of the trustworthy friends of Christ. I'm going to back up to verse 13. Look at it from verse 13 now. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for, tell me, his friends, his friends. You know, sometimes uh, we have used the word believers, believers, but there's something more. Sometimes we say, I'm a child of God, there's something more. Sometimes we say, I'm a convert, there's something more. Sometimes we say, I'm a sage, there's something more. He says, He calls us friends. He calls us friends. He says uh, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. Look at that. Ye are my friends. He was talking to some disciples. Ye are my friends. If ye do whatsoever, I command you. Look at verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, uh, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you, tell me, friends. The third time now, in uh, this uh, short passage, is calling the believer's friend. He says, I've called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. And he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Why did he say that? Because there's no friendship or fellowship between light and darkness. Because you are willing to quit darkness, leave darkness, come out of darkness and come into the light. I have chosen you. You have not chosen me. I was watching you. There's no fellowship. There's no friendship between good and evil. And if you wanted to keep to evil and remain in evil and perpetrate evil, I wouldn't choose you. But because you are willing to come out of evil and come into the goodness of the Lord, into the grace of God, I have. you have not chosen me. I have chosen you. There's no friendship. There's no fellowship between righteousness Righteousness and unrighteousness. If you are cleaving to your righteousness, if you are embracing your righteousness, if you are getting deeper and deeper in your unrighteousness, I wouldn't choose you to be a friend. But I've chosen you, you have not chosen me because I saw that you are willing to quit unrighteousness. You are willing to run away from righteousness and come into righteousness. There is no fellowship, there's no friendship between truth and error. If you were holding on to the tradition of uh, those uh, uh, people that didn't want the truth, you were holding on to error, I wouldn't want you to be a friend. But because you let the error, 
and you ran away from the error and you repented from the error and you threw away the false doctrine and you came into the truth that's why I chose you there is no fellowship and there is no friendship between holiness and hypocrisy if you had remained like those Pharisees hypocritical and they were white on the outside but black on the inside if you didn't really choose the inward transparent holiness and you were hypocritical I would not have chosen you you have not chosen me but I have chosen you there's no friendship and there's no fellowship between Christ and the Antichrist if you made up your mind you are going to follow the Antichrist someone opposed to Christ a doctrine opposed to Christ a lifestyle opposed to Christ I wouldn't have chosen you but I've chosen you now because of your choice that you are going to forsake everything false everything evil everything dirty everything defiling and you came to Christ that's why I have chosen you and I've chosen you for one reason and ordained you that you should Go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit shall remain. And that your fruit shall abide. Your fruit will abide in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to understand that, uh, you know, the language Jesus Christ was using when he says, ye are my friends. The Heavenly Father used that language to start with. Let's look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 23. James chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 23. You'll see the, you know, the first person to be a friend of God. Uh, look at uh, James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was, uh, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and it was called, tell me, the friend of God, not before conversion, not when in idolatry, not when in darkness, but when he had the word of God and he repented and he believed in the Lord and then the Lord counted that for him as righteousness and then he became uh, the friend of God. And Christ is now saying, it's your turn. Like Abraham uh, was a friend of God the Father, you can be a friend of Jesus. Look at Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 41. And we're reading from verse.